So, uh, we saw two relatively simple log fee algorithms. Uh, and now we'll see two uh, slightly more complicated uh, algorithms. I hope we'll have sufficient time to see them both. And the first is uh, Maged Michael's linked list algorithm. It's the same Maged Michael that was one of the authors here in the Q algorithm. Uh, yeah. And actually what we will see is an implementation of a set based on the linked list. So the linked list will uh, uh, contain some values that we can order according to uh, the values themselves or according to a hash uh, value that we apply to, to this value, a hash function, sorry, that we apply to these uh, values. And uh, it will store a collection of items where there are no duplicates and will support uh, three operations. Uh, the add operation adds another item X to the set. It returns a Boolean value. If X is already in the set, then it returns false. Otherwise, it succeeds in adding X to the set and returns two returns a success indication. Remove of item X searches for X. If X is on the set, it will be removed and the remove operation will return a success indication. It will return true. Otherwise, remove will return false because the item is not in the set, so it cannot be removed. And the contains operation will return true or false. Uh, according to whether or not the item was found in the set. Now this is a, an example of an implementation where different operations provide different progress guarantees. Because as we will see, the add and remove operations are log free. So they may fail again and again, but only if other operations make progress. But the contains operation is wait free. So sometimes we can mix, uh, mix and match uh, different operations which provide uh, different progress guarantees. And it may make sense that the contains operation is stronger because often in, in such data structures, contains is the, more, is the operation that is called most and add and removed are uh, more rare. So we would like contains to be more efficient. So this is, uh, these are the signatures of the operation I just uh, mentioned. Uh, the type of the item in the set is uh, immaterial. We can either add, remove, or call uh, the operation contains. So this is a linked list. The representation will be a representation of a linked list. So we have a node structure as before, and each node contains the item itself. It contains the key. You can think of the key as maybe the hash value of the item. For simplicity, let's assume that keys are totally ordered and there are no duplicates. So we can arrange all the items in the list in this total order. And we also have the next reference. Okay. So in the previous algorithm, the Q algorithm, we already uh, uh, met the notion of a sentinel node a node that is always in the linked list. It's often uh, beneficial in order to not have to check all, uh, all cases if the uh, first reference is null or not null. So we make sure that head and tail are never null in the queue. So here, the algorithm uses actually two sentinel nodes that are always in the linked list. The left sentinel stores some value minus an infinity, which is a value that will never be associated with a real item. That's the left border of the list. And the rightmost node stores the value plus infinity, which is the maximum value which will be ever seen in the list. And no real uh, set element will have these values. So we know that there are always at least these two nodes, but in general, between these two nodes, we have real nodes with real values, and these will always be uh, arranged in an increasing order of the key. 
So this is the representation that the uh, algorithm uh, takes. So the general uh, logic uh, of applying an add or remove operation would be to search the uh, list, starting from the last sentinel going to the right, until we find the proper location where we would like to apply our operation. Um, but we may encounter a problem because we may have concurrent threads doing this at the same time, and then obviously they may interfere with one another. So let's see an example. Here we have A, B, C, and D arranged in increasing order of the keys. And say we have two threads, the green thread and the uh, red thread, both wanting to remove the same item C. So first, the uh, red thread starts to traverse the list from the uh, left sentinel until it gets to the right position. Now, what do we mean the right position? It gets to the uh, item that has the largest key, which is still smaller than C's key. So this is the predecessor of C. And here, it would like to apply its operation. But at the same time, we may stop this uh, uh, thread and have the green thread get to the same point. And now, it should be clear at this stage that if they change the structure of the list using right operations and not using stronger operations like compare and swap, we will get into trouble. So for example, in this case, both of them will do the same right, pointing the predecessor of this node to the successor node. Uh, but actually, why is this a problem? Now the structure of the list is okay, so why is this a problematic situation? I did? Okay, so we, we're not talking about memory reclamation here. We assume that we never reuse a node. So let's assume that this is not a problem. But the question is, what will these operations return? What is the return value? If we have two concurrent remove C operations applied to the set, only one should succeed. One should return uh, success, because it succeeded to remove node C, and the other should return failure, because when it is applied, C is no longer in the set. Okay, so if both of them apply this right, then they both succeed, and uh, this is not a legal situation. We, we have to, to uh, find a way in which these two concurrent operations cannot both succeed. So clearly we need stronger synchronization operation, and as always, at least in this uh, talk, uh, we will use a uh, compare and swap. Okay, so now, assume that both these operations have searched until they find the predecessor of C, and now both of them would like to apply compare and swap in order to switch this pointer to point at the successor of C instead of C. So one of them, the first that will succeed in performing CAS, will know that it succeeded. It will receive, receive a success indication from the compare and swap operation. And the other will fail. Okay, so we have fixed the problem that we saw before. Is it okay up until now? Okay, so we need to use compare and swap. This is just what these two slides show us. We cannot just use reads and writes. But it turns out that this is still not sufficient to use compare and swap. And let's see why. So now assume that we have, again, two threads trying to remove uh, an, an uh, item from the set. But this time, they would like to remove different items from the set. So the green thread would like to remove the B node, and the red would like to remove the C node. And let us see a scenario 
showing us that just using compare and swap uh, will not uh, necessarily allow us to do this uh, correctly. So let's say that, uh, let's assume that the red uh, thread goes first. So it scans the list from the left sentinel going right until it reaches the correct location in the list. Later we will see the pseudocode that will show us exactly how this traversal of the list uh, is being done. So now the scheduler can stop the red thread at this stage and the green, the green thread uh, can actually stop at this point because it would like to remove node B. So what, ha what may happen at this stage is the following scenario. First, the red thread deletes C by pointing the next reference to node D. And this can be immediately, immediately followed by the green thread uh, changing this reference here to point to C. Okay? So each of them applied a compare and swap operation, but they apply their CAS operations to different nodes, to different references. So these two separate CASs do not interact with one another. And so what we get is this new list, which is uh, clearly not, not correct because these two operations were supposed to, to have succeeded, but still we have node C in the list. Okay? Is the problem clear? Okay, so we need to do something uh, smarter in order to uh, solve this problem. And the idea that is used by uh, Michael's algorithm is to actually do the uh, removal in two stages, somehow similar to the two stages of the um, of the NQ in the Q algorithm we saw before. So, in a sense, removal is now being done lazily. We add a, a mark field. We'll see this in more detail uh, shortly. We add a mark field to every list node. And we partition the deletion to two stages. In the first stage, we do logical removal. We just mark the node as logically deleted. Now say that a thread A marks a node as deleted, and then thread B traverses the list and arrives at the logically deleted node, then thread B will know that this node is no longer the item there is no longer part of the set. So once we mark a node as deleted, the item there is no longer a part of the set. The second stage is the physical removal, which is similar to what we saw before. First, we mark the node as logical, and then we physically delete it from the list structure by pointing the node's predecessor its next field to point to the node's successor. So let's see how this is done uh, using this very nice animation from the presentation accompanying uh, the book by Nir and Morris. So in this scenario, uh, this is the mark field. If it is green, it uh, signifies that the node is uh, part of the set. Once the mark uh, field is being set, changed to red, then it's no longer part of the set. This is the logical deletion. And the physical deletion is just to short circuit this node by pointing the reference of the predecessor to point at the successor. So these are the two steps of removal uh, in the algorithm that we'll see. Any questions about this idea? Okay. Uh, So let's uh, reconsider the uh, problematic scenario that we saw before that made us reach the conclusion that compare and swap by itself is not sufficient. 
So here's the same scenario. The green thread would like to remove B, so it has to perform an operation on the predecessor of B, which is the node with A, and the red node would like to remove C, and now the red node first deletes this node logically, and only then it will try to short circuit the node. So this is what it does here. And now the, the which one? Yeah, the green thread marks node B as logically deleted, and now points its predecessor to point at the successor. So at this stage, we do have C in the list structure, but it is designated as logically deleted. So it's not a problem. So unlike the previous representation that we saw, in this representation of the list, of the set, sorry, the set consists of all the items that are reachable from the left sentinel and that occupy nodes that are not logically deleted. So we can reach this node at this stage from the uh, uh, head of the list, but it is marked as deleted, so it's not a problem. So unlike the previous example, where after the two deletions, C was still part of the set, here it's not part of the set, so it's not a problem anymore. So is the use of the uh, logical deletion by the mark bit clear and why it solves the, the problematic scenario that we saw before? Any questions up until this point? Yes. Yes, that's a good question. The question is, is there some uh, sort of cleanup similar to what we saw before with the queue that fixes the physical structure of the list? Yes, there is. We will see this uh, soon in, in the code. Uh, any more questions? Okay. But unfortunately, this is still not enough. Yeah. I hope that after this scenario, you will believe me that this solves all possible problems. <laughs> but, okay. So why is this partition of the deletion to two steps still not enough? Uh, let's see. So, Assume that we have deleted this node uh, logically. The node is still physically accessible from the beginning of the uh, list, from the left sentinel. The problem is that the next reference, which is a different field, can still be manipulated. So there can be a scenario in which after the node is logically deleted, some other thread who checked this marked bit before, and when it checked it was green, it was okay, decides to add here a new node, this node D. And on the other hand, the thread that did the logical deletion of C, after doing that, performs the second step and does the physical deletion. So now we are left out without this node D that was added. So it is not enough to partition the deletion to two stages, logical deletion and physical deletion. We must somehow uh, synchronize these two fields. In other words, when a node is logically deleted, we must not allow operations that change its next reference. So in order to do that, uh, we use a, a class in Java that's called Atomic Markable Reference, which uh, allows us to atomically manipulate these two fields, both the flag and the reference. But before showing the uh, interface of this class, are there any questions about the problem that we see here? Okay. So, as I said, we must prevent the manipulation of the next reference of a node after we have deleted the node logically. 
Um, so the, this idea of combining the magbit and the pointer appears in Michael's algorithm, but was previously used by an algorithm, uh, previous algorithm by Harris. So it's sometimes called the Harris and Michael algorithm. So in order to do that, we use, as I said, the atomic markable reference class, uh, which is also part of the java.util concurrency atomic package. And uh, when we use it, we ensure that once we uh, set the marked bit in a node, we no longer can change the uh, next reference using CAS. We will see uh, shortly how uh, this is done. So the problem that we saw before, that this node is logically deleted, but immediately, immediately after that, this node is added, will not happen anymore because the compare and swap operation trying to add node D will fail because the mark bit is set. And then it would have to retry until it succeeds correctly. Okay, so that's the idea. Let's see uh, how Java allows us to do that. So it provides us with this class, Atomic Markable Reference, which actually encapsulate these two fields together. So we have a reference. In our case, this is a reference to the next node in the list structure. And we also have the mark bit. And there is a single compare and swap that is conditioned on both. So for example, we can apply a compare and swap operation that will change the address only if the mark bit is false. That is only if the node is not logically deleted, which is exactly what we want. And how is this implemented uh, in Java? Well, we know that objects are generally uh, aligned, at least word aligned. This means that if we use uh, references, we can steal the least significant bit and use it for other purposes while still knowing exactly to which object the reference points to. And so the implementation in Java steals the uh, least significant bit and uses it, uses it as the mark bit in the implementation of this class. So what is the API supported by this class? Well, we can call a get function on the object, which returns, which returns to us both the value, the current value of the reference, and the current value of the mark. It's done in a bit strange manner, in which the mark bit is returned as the first item in a Boolean array, but disregard this uh, detail, what's important is that with, by calling get, we receive these two values, both the reference and the mark bit, the cu their current values. Uh, we can only uh, read or get the value of the reference or only get the value of the mark. But the most significant operation for our purposes is the compare and set, which changes the two fields, the values of the two fields, conditioned on their current values. So it receives four arguments. Um, the expected values of the reference and the mark, and the algorithm by uh, uh, Michael will use this so that whenever we would like to change uh, some reference, we only do that if the current value of the mark is, is zero, that is, the node is not marked. We don't want to change the reference if the node is already logically deleted so its mark is being set. So if what the operation does is, if the current value of the reference is this value, the expected value, and the value of the mark is also what we expect, in our case zero, the node is not marked, only then we will change the values of the reference and the mark to the second and fourth arguments. And uh, the way the algorithm will use it it will require, as I said before, that the um, expected mark be 
zero, and the updated mark will be zero as well. So only the reference will be changed. Okay, so now I can state the key ideas of the algorithm after we have find, after we found some problems with more simplistic ideas. We have the, uh, uh, the plan in place. Each operation scans the list from the left sentinel to the right in increasing order of keys. Modifications are applied, applied using compare and swap. They are partitioned to two steps. First, logical deletion, and then physical deletion. Uh, but uh, the change of the reference uh, is conditioned on the fact that the node is not logically deleted. And whenever an operation finds that the structure needs to be fixed, that is, whenever an operation reaches a logically deleted marked node, it attempts to also physically remove it from the linked list, that is, to clean the list so that we won't have too many logically deleted uh, items in it. So these are the, the key ideas of the algorithm. Um, let's see uh, the pseudocode, but any questions up to this point? Yes. Okay, the question is, what happens if we remove, remove a node and then uh, uh, return it? Uh, the algorithm knows how to cope uh, with uh, such a situation. So a node can be removed uh, logically and then added again, but uh, the operation that will uh, uh, add this node might pass through the previous chain of nodes that are logically deleted and then fix them. It might have to fix them before it can add the new node with the same key. We'll see the pseudocode uh, shortly. More questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. I was afraid that by showing you a few scenarios that don't work, you will be suspicious of the algorithm that I show here. Maybe it also does not work. First, I must say that it's not my algorithm. So. Uh, and also, there is a correctness proof, which, which we will not get into uh, in this. Uh, so, uh, if you don't have a formal rigorous proof of correctness, or you, maybe you prove correctness using a model checker, then uh, you can't be 100% sure. But there is a correctness proof in the algorithm, in the, in the paper, so in the paper by uh, Michael. Yes. Okay, once a node is logically deleted, as we will see, this is actually the linearization point. The node is no longer in the list. So let's assume a scenario in which uh, a node is logically deleted, and then another thread tries to add uh, this node, uh, exactly the same key, then it will traverse the list, it will reach this point, and it will try to correct uh, the situation, that is to physically remove the previous node before it can add its own uh, node. Let's see the pseudocode. I think this will uh, answer most questions, and if not, I will uh, address them then. Okay, so let's see the remove operation. Uh, so we would like to remove some item T. And again, the, the very typical structure of log-free algorithms, which uh, typically operate in a loop, uh, trying to apply the operation in each iteration. And if the algorithm is log-free but not weight-free, we may have to perform these iterations again and again. So first, the logic of the remove and the add operations is somewhat factored out by implementing a find operation that is used by both. So we will 
soon describe this operation, but I will just tell you at this stage that what it does, it traverses the list, starting from the head, looking for the key uh, to which we would like to apply the operation, namely this is the key we would like to either remove from the set or to add to the set. And what this function returns is an object of type window, which is just two neighboring nodes where we would like to apply the operation. So it returns two fields. Uh, the window object contains two fields, predecessor and current, such that a current stores the key, the smallest key, which is greater or equal to the key to which we would like to apply the operation. And pred is the predecessor node. So pred actually uh, is the node that stores the largest key that is still smaller than the key to which we would like to apply the operation. So in either case, we know that we would like to apply the operation uh, in the vicinity of these two nodes. This is the window on the list where we would like to apply the operation. So we will see soon how this function traverses uh, the list, maintaining the, the pair of nodes pred and car. And what it also does is fix the structure of the list through the traversal. So whenever a logically deleted node is found, the operation also tries to physically delete this node. Okay? So let's uh, uh, wait a few minutes until we see the actual pseudocode of the find operation, but I told you what it does. And once we have this pred and car uh, reference, we simply check. If car.key is not equal to key, so we would like to remove an item, uh, the item with a, a key, and if the item is not in the list, then we simply return false. Okay? Because as I said, um, car.key is uh, the item in the set with the uh, smallest key which is uh, greater or equal to the key to which we would like to apply the operation. So if car.key is different from the item to which we would like to apply the operation, then we know that it is not currently in the set. Otherwise, we know that uh, the item is in the set. So what we do is we first try to logically delete this item. So what we do is we uh, perform the uh, get reference operation. So uh, I maybe should have told you that the next reference in our representation is an atomic markable reference, as we saw before. So in this line, we read the value of the reference, and in the next line, we apply the compare and set, uh, and all we do is we try to delete the node logically. So we try to change the uh, mark bit from false to true, uh, and we don't change the reference. So there are two possibilities here. Uh, if we fail, what can be the reason that we fail? Yes? Someone uh, operates, some other threads uh, operate concurrently with us, and maybe they delete this node uh, logically before us. Maybe they change uh, the, uh, the next reference. So it might be that another node is added after the current node uh, between the time that we read the reference and try to change it. So if this is the case, we have to try again. What does it mean that we try again? We go to the next iteration, we search for the uh, node with the key we would like to operate on once again, and we repeat all this logic. And it's okay, because if we failed, it's only because another operation successfully 
was performed, either a deletion operation or an addition operation. So it's legitimate to fail in this case and to reiterate the algorithm is still log free. Okay, so the compare and swap operation, its return code is stored in this SNP local variable. If SNP is true, that is, if the compare and swap operation did succeed, then we would like to fix the structure of the list. Uh, as I said, after the logical deletion, there comes the physical deletion, and this is what is attempted here. So, uh, the next reference, which, as I said, is a markable atomic reference, we apply compare and set on this reference, and if the reference value is car and, uh, and the node is still uh, logically part of the set, then we change its value to successor. That is, we point from the node's predecessor, as we see here, to the successor. This is the node that was logically deleted. But here, it doesn't matter to us whether this compare and swap succeeds or not. Why is it not important for the operation? Why don't we have to check whether the return code of this compare and swap is true or false? Yes, because either we will fix it, in which case uh, this operation will return true, or if we fail, it's only because another uh, thread before us fixed uh, this reference and pointed from the predecessor to the successor. So it doesn't matter to us whether we succeed in doing that or whether uh, another operation does that, because at the moment that we have logically deleted the node, then the uh, remove operation actually took place, and fixing the physical reference is just a technical thing that either we or another thread will do, but it does not change the, uh, the set that is represented by the linked list. So, before we'll see the add uh, procedure, any questions regarding the remove? Okay. So regarding uh, linearization points, um, there are actually two. One is when the operation uh, succeeds, that is, it finds the requested item and removes it from the list. In this case, as we are already used to, the operation is linearized when the compare and swap succeeds in doing the logical deletion. So the linearization point is the point of the logical car deletion cars and not of the physical deletion cars. Uh, as for the other linearization point, it's actually in the find procedure. So when the node we would like to delete is not part of the set, in which case remove returns false, then the linearization point is inside the find procedure, which will soon see the pseudocode of the find. Okay, let's see the pseudocode of the, yes. This one? Could you speak a little louder? <laughs> Ah, okay. Uh, the question is, why don't we return false at this point? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, assume that we try to remove the uh, node with, uh, with the key we were looking for, and we failed. Uh, could we not just uh, return false at this uh, stage? What do you think? Okay, but uh, it's true that the node is not there already, but we know that the node did exist uh, at some point during the execution of this procedure because it was found by the find procedure. So we know that the node was logically deleted 
it may be that after it was logically deleted, is what it was added once again. But still, I think you are right. Uh, I think the procedure could have returned uh, false at this stage because we know there was some time during the execution of the procedure where this node was logically deleted. So it's a matter of uh, performance, not correctness. Both options are correct. It was correct, if I'm not mistaken, to return uh, false here instead of continuing. And it's also legitimate to continue. The, the implementation is still log free. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, more questions?